broadcasting from the Blanchestan Centre. This is Phoenix FM. This is 92.5 Phoenix FM. Community radio for Dublin 15. Hey everybody, it's JB Jeremy Borash and you are listening to Daryl O'Connor on the... Welcome to the Wrestling Rewind, the only wrestling podcast by fans who don't hate wrestling. Welcome to Phoenix 92.5 FM, Nerds No Media, the True Penny Channel, and of course here on YouTube, Spotify, and wherever else podcasts are made available. If this is your first time checking this out, please go over to nerdsnomedia.com, Nerds no Media on YouTube, and subscribe, because... This show is a fan submission show. So, again, we didn't pick this topic. Martin, who did pick this topic? Well, Dara, uh, this week's topic was picked by Nick Opelowski. Opelowski. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, Nick, but thank you very much for getting in touch with us. He is from New Haven, Michigan. Or New Haven. He's written New Haven. I don't know if that's a, a town or just a, a, a typo. But anyway, Nick's from Michigan somewhere, um, and he wants us to review Bash at the Beach 1997. Sharp intake of breath. Don't worry, it's not the dregs of WCW. It's actually very good WCW. Yeah, it's uh, actually it's actually the, the peak of WCW because it's like <laughs> it's before WWE got its edge. So WCW were beating WWE's brains in. So it's actually like the final it, big peak of WCW before yeah, it actually declines. NWO is still kind of hot at this stage. Yeah. Uh, the undercard is absolutely banging. Like this, the first half of, of this show is is pretty sensational. Um, yeah, like you say, uh, WCW is still riding high in the ratings. NWO hadn't gone off the rails. Um, they still had a lot of the a lot of the top not not the top guys, but a lot of the real workhorse talent hadn't left yet you know you still have your uh, like your four horsemen your jerichos um you know all those mid-card guys who were really putting the work in they're all still there and also the cornerstone of this show is on this show the cornerstone the man who built this show double j jeff oh! so happy when i saw him i was so happy when i saw him i was like yes he's back <laughs> He's everywhere. He's he's never going away. He's he, never going he, away. Is he? Has anyone else been like uh, maybe not a top guy, but has anyone else been a properly featured WCW, WWF, TNA, AEW guy? I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, Jer- you could you could make a point that Jericho, if you loop in ECW instead of TNA, and maybe Christian Cage could probably be the same but he wasn't in wcw like i think jeff jarrett's on his own maybe matched just under by jericho but yeah like oh but here's the question i have for you out of the gate right jeff jarrett could he be like the ultimate bookily but he has one world title so i don't think so yeah i I don't think like we were fairly loose with the bookily list and it's actually great you brought that up because nick has sent us his his bookily list but um yeah we're fairly loose with the definition what makes a bully? I, yeah, I just don't think Jarrett would qualify unless maybe if you if you broke his career down into eras, you right? Know, like his WWF, yeah, that's that's bully territory. <laughs> and, his, and his and his first WCW run before he came back probably as well. But like, yeah. I don't know. I like he, when he went back to WCW, he won a world title, and I know there's mixed feelings on that. And but then in TNA, honest, legitimately is great. So it is. And here, man, I, I know you haven't been watching, but some of his AEW run has been phenomenal. No, but um, that's what I'm saying. He, he like after after he he went back to WCW and start becoming the the chosen one. Everything he did after that, I mean, it's not bad. I I think it's outside the bookly the the bookly yeah, territory. You know, and, and in fact, even his maybe his initial WWF run 
when he's the country singer. Maybe that's that's Bootley that's territory. That's wonderful, though. I love it so much. <laughs> oh, it's peak Burley. I like. love it so much. Uh, but even his WWF run, man, the way he stitched up Vince for extra money to drop the IC title to China, I mean, that's... You kind of got to respect that a wee bit. Well, without that, there would have been no TNA. You know, yeah. That's or the bird, that's global, the bird. Was it global force at first he took on? or No, no, he did TNA first. All oh, right, right. Oh, sorry. Right. Technically, WWA, then TNA, um, then global force, then impact or whatever. But oh, I can't believe we left out his WWA run. The prestigious WWA oh, run. International. Like, <laughs> shows all over the place. Like, that was... Uh, that was uh, one of those candles that burnt too brightly. Too I'm so quickly. glad when I'm so glad when we find when we're just like we have nothing to talk about, so we just like dust off a WWA show. But like yeah, here we go, in case of emergency, break glass, just WWA behind it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it just has everything: random gimmick infringement, you know, random <laughs> trade trademarks just gone out the window for some reason. Nathan yeah, Jones. They, they, did, they didn't even do the WCW thing where they were like, all right, so um, that's uh, for DDP's entrance music. Let's take Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit and change one chord. Do you know the way um, like you have those uh, dodgy chemists who'll take like the chemical compound of heroin and just change like one, one compound of it and then it's technically not heroin anymore, so it's legal? WCW was doing that with entrance music, um, but WWA didn't even go that far. WWA was just like, nah, st- stick out the road, dog. Jesse James, you didn't know. Go the whole hog. <laughs> Wearing the same ring gear. It's all same fine. ring gear. St- still has the wee WWF attitude logo on it. Stick them out there. I was going. I was, you know, I wasn't going to go as far as you did with the team music. I was going to say it's kind of like Vanilla Ice, where he uh, he just did under pressure, but changed one note, so it's slightly <laughs> different. <laughs> Um, yeah, but look, <laughs> here's the thing. So we will eventually, like, I, every time we see Jeff Jarrett, you know, you have to bring it up. We will eventually, like, go back to WA at some point when we when we have when we want to treat. You know, it's either that or um, the 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 random MTV wrestling that that I, I still can't get over. But um, oh, yeah. uh, Wrestling Society X, Wrestling Society X. I think yeah. it's always a good time. <laughs> But look, as I said, uh, this is a fan submission show. My name is Dara Connor, joined by Mr. One and O, Martin Herity. Martin, how's your week been, sir? It's It's been great. And before we get into Nick's Bohuli list, which he kindly sent to us, I have, a, I have an exciting update to our own Patreon tier list. Oh, it, exclusive. I don't know about this. Go on. It doesn't know about this, right? I don't. And it's in the vein of... It's in the vein of the X-Pac Euro. So... Yeah. As we know, if you didn't know that what is being shouted at the start of Xbox entrance music is actually make some noise and not Xbox or some version of that, then you owe us an Xbox Euro. So here's the latest update to that one. Dara, are you familiar with the song Cotton A Joe? Yes. What's the first line of that song? Oh. I don't know. Does, does this sound familiar? I've been yes. married a long time ago. Yes. Right. So up until this week, I thought the opening line of that song was Bada ba dip ba ba bo. Okay. It's it's actually if it hadn't been for Cotton A Joe, he he says it so weirdly and so quickly. The actual line is if it hadn't been for Cotton A Joe. After the show, go and look up the song on YouTube. It's mental. Right. So if what? you didn't know, if you didn't know that he is actually saying, if it hadn't been for Cotton A. Joe, I'd have been married a long time ago, and not but up but but up but bo, then you owe us a red a rednecks euro. I mean, it way it makes way more sense, but it. Do you know once you see the video, senses senses you put it to the side. It's not, well, it's, well, it's, actually, not, it's not required here. Well, actually, because it was in a, a like a 1982 song, and then it was remixed in the 90s as a dance song. So maybe originally, because I think it's a traditional American folk song. Oh, well, maybe there's a, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I've been going off the, the, the version of it that was big here by the band Rednecks. That's 
N E X. Yeah, um, but I mean, I I think if you if you look at the the line from it, it actually makes a bit of sense that that would be it. But still, oh, yeah, yeah it makes, I, I, I never the, the song makes more sense knowing the lyrics. Yeah, yeah, I I wouldn't have uh, that wouldn't have been my guess. <laughs> No, but it's the fact that we all yeah. just hopped our way through the nineties, just accepting ba da ba da ba da ba bo. Ah, the nineties were. We're going, where, yeah. Make, where, make that where, number one. But he did. Yeah. Although I suppose, like, God, what were we on? And there must have been lead in the water or something, because you had that. You had Scatman. Be ba 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 da ba. Absolutely was... banger! Though I was, I was funny enough. I was actually listening to well, Scatman's World is another song from that album, like yesterday. And it's it's a, a bit of a banger. I'm not gonna lie. You had um blue dabba dee dabba day. Yes. Just uh, yeah. If if you ever invent a time machine and you want to be rich, go back to the nineties. Just garble some nonsense out. Be number one overnight. See, once it has a good beat to it, that's all that mattered in the nineties. I think. Do you know when we jumped the shark? What? Crazy frog. Yeah, that's true. That was it. Yeah, that was, no, you're, that, you're, that was when people said, "All right, you've had your fun. Put that away now. <laughs> we'll not, we'll not look at that box again until um, Gangnam Style <laughs> in twenty years." Well, I don't know. I, I think uh, Korean pop and, and and Korean music in general, um, they, they're all having a good time. I actually saw a video of your man there, like doing the Rey Mysterio entrance, and it's like, oh, fair play to him. Like, like last week, he, he just he is just taking Rey Mysterio's entrance. You know where he jumps up? Your man from, from Gangnam Style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, I tell you what, fair play to him because he's not a small fella. I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to do that with, uh, <laughs> with my knees. No, and he, he's a fair bit older as well. So I'm yeah. like, but he probably still has his knees and like Rey Mysterio has like probably six or seven different people to the knees. Do you, do you know what it's, as Elsa would say it is? That, that Gangnam Style dance, like that yes. probably does a lot to strengthen the you know the, the 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 miscus and the hibiscus and the the discus and the I'm 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 being like a um, gorilla monsoon now when he used to be commentating on wrestling shows in the eighties and he just make up words for the scientific parts of the body. It's, oh, got him right in the mandula oblongate there. So so what I'm hearing is there needs to be a crossover. Yeah. <laughs> with Gangnam Style and Rey Mysterio. Yeah. yeah. And Gorilla Monsoon. Com- commentated by Gorilla Monsoon. Perfect. Book it, Gabe. <laughs> right. So look, Speaking so look, of right. booking us. Yes. So we're, we are going to, we're, we're not going to do any preamble this week. We're going to go straight into our time machine. And again, folks, if you want us to cover anything and we can see it easily, we absolutely will. Again, um, it, it's very simple. You can reach us out on Facebook, which, which is how, um, this one was submitted to us. We have an email as well. You can also leave a comment on youtube if you leave a comment please do subscribe um there to know media on youtube and you can just find us there the wrestling rewind.com will take you to links to all, all, for our socials and also for our email as well and that's how this was submitted so we're going to jump straight into time machine we're going straight back to july 13th 1997 daytona beach florida the ocean center in attendance of 7851 tagline hulk hogan and dennis rodman crash the bash Terrible taglines. Um, <laughs> yeah, but pretty pretty hot. Like uh, for the time, apparently yes. a really hot st- story. Like people really wanted to see uh, what Dennis Rodman was going to do in the ring. Yeah, and I mean, it wouldn't be the last time he'd be in wrestling. Um, Definitely, he would, not. Sh- he would show up a bunch more, uh, and probably will cover that at <laughs> in the future because well, it's so I wild. Think we've, I think we've covered some of his later stuff, and it did. I, th- I think it kind of peaks here. <laughs> yeah, no, like definitely, like you want to talk about jumping the shark moment. Like, not only is 1997 the peak of WCW, it is also kind of where it starts to decline, and the desperation kicks in after it. But now, now this is just a hot show. This is like, this is what was killing WWE at the time. Um, our commentator, te- te- sorry, our commentator team are Tony Schiavone, Bobby the Brain Heen, and Dustin Rhodes, and. Mike Tanae. The, the um, great he, Mike Tanae. Mike, the, the professor Mike Tanae. Now, he's not on main commentary. He's he's off doing the Roman reporter kind of thing. But what did you think of Dustin Rhodes oh, on man, commentary? That's wild you actually mentioned that. I have that in my notes. Um, I think Mike Tanae and Dustin Rhodes 
should have been swapped out or Dusty Rhodes should have been swapped out because yeah, Dusty is great in certain matches. Mm. I do not need him the whole way through the 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 Dusty shtick, baby. Yeah, um, it, it's it's very 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 trying. I'm it, like, I'm not gonna lie, it really they, does get to me. Yeah, if they had him in and out, you know, for certain matches where it suited it, like if they had him in for the main event, would have been cool. That would have been great. Yeah, the way they used to do with um, Jim Ross. Yeah, yeah. Um, or if they even and early in the show, maybe have him in one of the more fun matches where he can, you know, go full dusty, baby. Um, but oh man, three hours of of dusty in your ear was. It was, but by the end, I was getting like, shut up. Yeah, like, look, Mike Tanay is, and I will say this, any day of the week, the single best commentator in wrestling history. He's fantastic. Like, I know some people are like, oh, like Jim Ross is great. And he is, uh, well, he was, uh, less so now, but he, he was, you know, and he is like the voice of the yeah, actually there, etc. But and my, and even um, Michael Cole's getting a lot better now since Vince isn't there. But at the same time, consistently, if you're looking for a consistent commentator who is just able to just do it, Mike Tanay and and to have him there with Tony Schiavone, who is a great like a mix between the two, would have been great. And then Bobby the Brain is just he's my favorite color commentator. <laughs> he's always hilarious. Oh, he's, so. he's fantastic. Yeah, great. but uh, Bobby's the guy who uh, he's got his shtick. But yes. it's not it's not trying. It doesn't yes. it's more natural. Um, in fact, like I was saying, if you would have swiped out swapped out Tanea and Rhodes, I think Dusty Rhodes would have had a lot more fun doing the yep. interviews with the wrestlers, doing the you know, all that kind of backstage stuff, um or the in between bits. Like I think he would have been great there, peppered throughout. Um yeah. like that, that's, like it, Dusty is exactly it. Like he's he's pepper. He's not the entire yeah. dish. Do you know what it actually there, reminded yeah. me of? Go on. Um, during the COVID uh, era, there was there was a, a good few weeks where um, about half the half the kind of wrestlers and and other staff in AEW couldn't make it to shows, so mm. they kind of had to put people into different things, and they put Jericho into commentary for different matches, and it went over really well. He was really good. Um, but then it, it, they did that wrestling thing where they went, "Oh, this was this was good that time. Let's do it all the time now." Yeah, Jericho is another one who great when he's put in the right match, put in the right position to commentate. But I do not need a full two three hours <laughs> of oh. Jericho commentate. No, no, I, I think that's a punishment in certain countries. <laughs> um. yeah, Canada. <laughs> but look so our first match is well, um before we first... get into the first match we should cover nick's boohly list because okay uh, okay we can do of, that yeah one of boohly's is actually in the first match so dara isn't aware of this so we'll just we'll run through them and let's get your your thoughts on each of his his boohly's because some of these are quite interesting we start off with the barbarian who I would have associated with WWF more than WCW. No, he was great in the Dungeon of Doom as well. Like he had, looking looking at his run, like he had, uh, he has had a lot of championships, like tons and tons and tons of championships. But nothing in the WWF, nothing in in WCW that I can see. Um, but he did do a lot in the NWA. But well, he had sorry, he had the US Tag Team Championships. But that doesn't that's not even a belt anymore and, and wasn't particularly when uh it started getting start getting hot but um i don't know he's a he's a, definitely an interesting choice i i think we can make a call and say he he qualifies for for Bully status you think so i i think so i think he's i think he's actually, he's actually a pretty good shout in terms of a gay who a lot of people remember a lot of people are fans of but was never like at least, like you say, in terms of major North American companies, was never a top gay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, so next, we have a slightly confusing one. Uh, La Parca, but then isn't there a whole issue between La Parca and L.A. Parca and who was who? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For, so just without getting into the whole background of that, for clarity, like my... 
vision of La Parca is the guy who comes running out with, with the, the with the chair and, and plays guitar with the chair and so yeah, like, I think that I think I think that's who who he's referring to. Yeah, I mean it's bound to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's a whole issue there with La Parca and La Parca. Um, he's actually one of a lot of people have uh, kind of different memories of the Mexican wrestlers in WCW and people like um, sort of gravitate to certain ones. For me, it was a uh, uh, psychosis. Absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. Loved psychosis him. Great, yeah. But uh, La Park is actually on this show, and yes. you'll see why uh, Nick was uh, such a fan of him because he is phenomenal. No, I would, I would actually back this as well. Uh, La Parker is, is a very, very strong choice for Bookly status because he's. I think he hits all the points right. He has a gimmick that's instantly recognizable. That was super over. That was really cool. He could also go in the ring. You know what he is? He's WCW's um, Steve Blackman. He has a lot. Oh. Of the, he, yeah, he has a lot of the same kind of. You know, yeah, the Parker I, would legitimately kill you, like. And yeah, legitimately tough gay. Yeah, yeah, and he's not a joke. He's cool. He's kind of kind of goofy, but also, you know, really good. And like that's why I, I think like with the Bookley list, it, it's well, for me, it's like the guys who are kind of goofy but really good at the same time. But then there's like that slight bit of legitimacy as well. And yeah. Parker has all of that, and his like, matches are always great too. So, like when Steve Blackman's in the ring, swinging his sticks around and doing his karate stances, you can laugh at him, but. If you were out in the street and he did that, you would apologize, Mr. Blackman, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and immediately step aside. <laughs> and can I buy you a drink? <laughs> no. um, so, yeah, no, I'm, I think Park is, I think that's a great shout as well for the Bookley list. They have to have Absolutely. some sort of gimmick. It has to yeah. be. Uh, so, good shout, Nick. We like that one. You doing, dude? Uh, third one on the Bookley list is someone we've actually talked about before as a Bookley. Van Hammer. Ah, uh, Van Hammer, yes. Love Van Hammer. Love it. I, I love Van Hammer. He is a, a wrestler who I, whenever I see him, I'm mad into it. And whenever I don't see him, I completely forget he exists. Just, and I, I never think about him ever again <laughs> until he shows up. And I'm like, oh yeah, Van Hammer. It's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Like he, I think he was just, he came up at the wrong time, right? But then when he did show up, he was kind of tossed into gimmicks that were never either in service of someone else or just, you know, dying on the vine. So he didn't really get a chance in, in WWE that much. But when he went to WCW, his big his big chance was with the flock. And here's the thing. You might not remember the flock. Because oh, I remember nobody, the flock, yeah. No, but nobody really remembers who was in the flock, right? Because it wasn't really about them. It was about Raven. Uh, Ra- Raven. <laughs> you know? And then he was uh he did the mis- misfits in action stuff as well. Um and that was also really bad. Because it, like it he never terrible, he never got an opportunity yeah. to put himself over, you know, or to, to elevate. It was always like in service of something else. So it's unfortunate, but Van Hammer, like, he's great. It's just really unfortunate that he never got a chance to to show who he was on the well, on he, a he, he got he got more of a chance in WCW than he got in WWF. He had in early WCW. He he had two uh, tryout matches, yes. dark matches for the WWF, and in one he was beaten by Damian Demento, huh. and then in the other he was beaten by Virgil. And Virgil probably charged him the tenor for the privilege. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> to take a picture with him. Yeah. They're, they're, they're filming this show. That's that's technically a picture. You owe me a tenor. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes up. He's like, hey, man, listen, come on. But uh, yeah, so great it, shout, Nick, on, yeah. on Van in Hammer. Er, in early WCW, definitely. And it, it's a shame like that. He had a good four years. And I think that's why, you know, you can really see what he could do. And it's just unfortunate that WWE didn't give him a chance. And then when he went back to WCW, they're like, oh, there you go. In those random staples that we're never going to talk about again. So, yeah. Great show, Nick. The flock. All right. But Misfits in action. Absolute death spot. Yeah. Um, His second last one is Wrath or Wrath in WCW. 
better known in WWF as Adam Bomb. Adam Bomb's like a Buckley staple. He's, all-star. He's everyone's Buckley. He's an all-star. Love, love Brian Clark. Um, so obviously, you know, not only, and you left out one of the big ones, Chronic. Oh, Chronic. See, now, I, oh, I don't know if I'd put Chronic. Nah, Chronic's definitely Buckley. I know, no, Chronic and WCW were class. And for they some reason, they great. just forgot how, they forgot how to be class when he went to WWE and Taker and Kane killed them. What? Every like, week. oh, God, there, there needs to be a whole thing done there on that invasion angle because some of those guys, like, I assume, like, maybe they just got, like, terribly treated backstage. Yeah, absolutely. And, that, 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 that had to have happened, yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, I remember watching Chronic Match going, are these guys, are these guys, deadly yeah, they, like that's the thing you watch the latter wcw and chronic are one of the best things on it along with booker t and scott steiner and then they go to wdb and it's like oh my god what is what is this trash but uh it, it i don't think it was the fault of of brian clark um or brian adams you know um but yeah anytime that brian clark is there adam bomb wrath brings it so oh. good so Always good. a good time. But here's the thing as well. That gimmick, right? Like, if Brian Clark showed up today as Adam Bomb or Wrath, super over. Crazy, crazy, crazy over. Because he kind of, he has the look, he has the styles, he has the moveset, and it, you, you take him legitimately seriously. Like, the thing about it is, it's like, in the era now of, like, you know, know what he is. And this is going to be high praise. The Wrath gimmick specifically, right? That is Bray Wyatt but someone who can go. Oh, yeah. There you go, yeah. That's just, it's, he's got that kind of missing component. Yeah. And, like, that's why anytime you see him, you're like, right, this match is going to be good. He's going to be one of the best things in it. But he still has that kind of, like, gimmick where it is a silly wrestling gimmick, but it works. And Adam Bomb was the same. So, absolute, yeah. Bookly All-Star. Definitely. I'll tell you what, um, I think part of uh, his kind of legitimacy comes from, apparently he was quite well received um, when he did a stint in All Japan Pro Wrestling. Oh yeah, I believe and, it too, yeah. Yep. You know, the, the <laughs> Japanese wrestling guys do not mess about. No, 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 no. They, they, if you're not able to go, you're not able to go. Um, and taking up the... the the last spot on his bookily list is a phenomenal shout here. And it's weird. I think this is a phenomenal shout, even though I've never actually seen him. I only know him from someone else. El Dandy. And my reason for loving El Dandy is because one of the few times when Bret Hart, who I love to pieces, who was one of my all-time favorite wrestlers, one of the few times when he actually showed a bit of like humor in a, one of his promos is a, a pretty famous one from WCW where he's doing that heel gimmick where he's the US champion and he's like, I'll fight anyone, I'll take anyone on. And, uh, you know, I've been looking at the locker room and I've been looking at all these guys and someone I think really deserves a shot is, is El Dandy. El Dandy really deserves a shot. So, you know, like he was deliberately picking out guys that he could, he could bait no bother. <laughs> have you have you ever seen I've I've no idea but have you ever seen El Dandy? I haven't, but I'm going to make it my my uh my mission now to check him out more because that sounds hilarious. It's, if you haven't even seen that uh WCW promo, look it up. It's with the, um it's with the uh, uh mean, mean Gene Okerland and Mean Gene keeps it rejected going, What are you talking about? You got like eighty pounds on the guy. <laughs> it's like six inches shorter than you. So is it kind of like the Crash Holly thing where it's like he's such a joke but thinks he isn't? Yeah, well, again, I'm assuming so. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm looking at his at his uh, build, height, and weight here. So he was 5'7 and <laughs> 90, 90 kilos. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, it's, it's definitely an, inter- an interesting choice. Um, I don't know if he'd be on my bookie list for the same reason that Crash Holly isn't. Um, because like there's no legitimacy there, um, but definitely he's memorable. Uh, yeah, well, look, it's a good choice. He debuted in 1981. Wow, he retired in 2014. Oh my god, what a his career. list. 
his list of, of companies here, he wrestled for everyone from CMLL, NWA, Mexican Middleweight, WD- oh, a WWA tag team champion. Oh, my God. And a WWA is where that's a missing link. We we might have to do a, 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 an El Dandy series. <laughs> <laughs> an El Dandy arc. <laughs> uh, this guy's awesome. Yeah, so Nick, top tier Berkeley list. Thanks oh, a million. Phenomenal. Phenomenal stuff, Nick. Thank you so much for that. We uh, we do appreciate it. And folks, look, if you want our opinions on your Berkeley list, please do send them to us. Again, the best way to do it is underneath this video, Facebook, or if you want to go over to Patreon, you can drop us some money and we can, we can do it there because we would appreciate that as well. But, you know... Yeah, some good picks. I have to say, um, I, I I really want to check out El Dande now. I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, right. Okay. The opening the opening match. The opening contest was Mortis and Wrath with James Vanderberg defeating Glacier and Ernest Miller. Now, so Mortis is somebody who we love quite a lot on this show. Yes. Chris Canyon. Sensational. Rath. Wrath is Adam Bomb. Glacier is, unfortunately, uh, Glacier was just Glacier. Um, he does work as a producer for AEW, though, and Ernest Miller is Ernest Cat Miller. So, look, this match is, is very much a product of its time. I think it is quite cool, though. Um, the Glacier gimmick, it, it, it doesn't work, but it does work. I don't hate it, like, at all. Um, it's it's very very nineties. Uh, it is very nineties, but really, it, it's but the thing about it is, I think we're, it, we're in ninety seven here. Like it might have been okay in ninety three, but uh, ninety seven things are getting a bit a bit edgier, a bit grittier, a bit more realistic. And on a yeah. show with the NWO, it doesn't work. No, but that being said, um, Wrath and mortis works a lot better like obviously james vanderberg is far to james mitchell um you know sans his uh you know he, he, he's not doing what he would do in nwa in 2024 so he's not doing that but james mitchell uh when when he is given some sort of direction and and booked properly he's one of the greatest managers of all time obviously in his stuff in tna with with abyss uh yeah. shows that but i think when he's in there with with like big guys um because of how slimy he is, it, it just like all kind of comes together. So having him outside the ring was really cool. This tag team probably should have been given more than just an open and belt with each other. But there was so much talent there, and, and the, the, the top of the card was so hot as it was. This is probably the, the best use of them. So what I mean, even though that's a backhanded compliment, it's like the the, the card is so stacked that the opening contest that has its flaws is still one of the better matches on the card, which is wild. Oh, I I really enjoyed this. Um, like I say, Mortis and Rat, what a great tag team! Like two big guys who can move, doing some really innovative double team stuff here. But this is Canyon. Like that's the thing. Like there's a, there's a spot where they um, they set up the chair from under the ring, and there's like a, a tag team super kick. That's oh, unreal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Um, yeah, they hold the guy up against the post outside the ring and hold the chair over his face and then Canyon super kicks it. It's deadly. Uh, there's an awesome powerbomb neck breaker uh, double team move. Um, and then they end with a cool bit of cheating where uh, during a pinfall attempt, I think it is it on, on Mortis? Yeah. Um, the uh, uh, James Vanderberg leans in and wraps a, a chain around his foot. So mm. when he gets up and he super kicks him again, he knocks your man's head off with the with the super kick. It's very good. It, but that's the thing, like the, how using James Mitchell that way, it was perfect. And again, like look, I really like Canyon as Canyon, but as Wrath, whatever it is about that mask, it just makes him look a lot more intimidating. Uh, it, it's a look, it's a great team. It, it was a great tag team match and super innovative. Like again, um, having Brian Clark there with Canyon, they're just going to do the most innovative stuff that they can. 
And they did it. Like, look, Glacier and Ernest Miller, they're Glacier and Ernest Miller. They're, they're doing their best. But even yeah. even Ernest Miller was, he was a... Uh, he was throwing out a couple of really cool. Ke- I know he's kicks. the karate guy, but yeah. he was throwing out a couple of really cool kicks. The only thing that caught me a is um, he's wearing boots in this yes. match. Yes, and his gimmick later on, which always confused me, was he would he would wrestle barefoot, but then whenever he was cheating, his manager would slide a shoe into the ring, and he'd put the shoe on and <laughs> kick the guy, and then he'd have to hide the shoe. And I'm like. It's sh- sh- everyone else is wearing shoes. Shoes are allowed. It's just, you're not cheating by putting on, a, putting on a, like as long as it's not like a hobnail boot, you know. But the thing about the the kicks, um, with Ernest Miller, like he was a three time karate world champion, so he's able to kick. It's just for some oh, reason, oh yeah, like is really impressive in this. Yeah, yeah, no, like everyone looked really well in that. Like it's not just a, a jobber match, you know, which is no, it was actually kind of a perfect opener. Absolutely. You know, you got the big names coming on later on, but you get some really physically impressive guys out there, Mortis and Rack, doing really big bombs. You have some of the, you know, the kind of goofy or gimmicky or guys that the crowd love, like um, Ernest Miller. And I mean, I can't say that the crowd loved Glacier. No, <laughs> they didn't. It sounded like we really hate him. Honestly, don't. No, we don't. It's just kind of nothing, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he's like, he's just there. But like, I think the thing about Glacier is if you replaced him with anyone, it would still be the same, you know, or better. Same yeah. or better. Yeah, so, well, it wasn't going to get worse. So, no, uh, no, absolutely not. But really good opening match. So this was followed up by our first title defense. The WCW Cruiserweight Championship was defended with Chris Jericho going as the champion, defeating the Ultimo Dragon in about 13 minutes of a fire match. You know, I missed, obviously, Chris Jericho's a lot older now, um, but we wouldn't even see this in WWE when he debuted uh, like two years later. This is Chris Jericho at his absolute peak in ring. Uh, it's, it's great. It really is phenomenal. Oh, he's incredible. This is a, a really, really underrated period of his career. He's just back from, or not long back from Japan at this stage. So he's... Yeah. He's really good. He's Jericho had a great cruiserweight style in that he uh, could do all the you know the really impressive bouncing, dive, and flipping, but um, he also had a really believable, like a uh, uh, very impactful ground game. You know, like a lot of the cruiserweights can bounce around, and it looks like you know they could flip seven times, but they just bounce off you. Jericho always looked like his stuff had a lot of impact to it as well. It's it's because he's that much bigger, you know. He he like even compared to Ultimate Dragon, like he he just looks like physically more imposing than, you know. He 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 was a cruiserweight. He was a cruiserweight on the line <laughs> to put that in where he's like, yeah, he he's small, but like, yeah, you know, he's, he's small compared to Hogan. Yes, exactly. You know, but, like but he's not. not but again, if you came across Chris Jericho in a bar, you wouldn't, you wouldn't chance him. You know? Absolutely, yeah. He's, and it, he's small compared to the literal giants in the upper end of the yard. But it's it's funny though, like when you put him up to Ultimate Dragon, like he he is like Ultimate Dragon is what you think of a cruiserweight as, right? Um, yeah. And then Jericho's in there, and he's able. To, and the great thing about this match is they work that. Where every time Ultimo Dragon goes on the offense, he's taking advantage of being that little bit quicker, that little bit smaller. And then Jericho's able to shut him down by doing, you know, the jumps to the outside, the flips, or just giving him a, a, a power bomb that takes him <laughs> out of time. Like, you know, you're just, it's just a real solid punch. Yeah, or just a real solid punch. And it's just like, it, it's a really, really nice, dynamic cruiserweight match. Which I know most cruiser matches are in that way, but it's not just, you know, flip, flip, flip. It's like flip, 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 dig to the head, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it's, 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 it's actually really, really good to see. Um, and, and this is an, an underrated or it's, it's underrated sometimes on the card itself, but in the history of WCW, it's something that people like talk about an awful lot. And this oh, is yeah. for good reason. And this is like, we were talking earlier about how this is 97. This is peak WCW. I mean, don't WCW. just mean NWO like this is peak WCW and that amazing cruiserweight division like yeah. even though that cruiserweight division when 
things really go downhill in the next couple of years, that's kind of the only division that's keeping things alive. Like, do you remember we were reviewing those, like, latter days um, pay-per-views? Yeah. And the opening match would be, like, some amazing Cruiserweight match. You'd be like, oh, maybe this is going to be okay. And, you know, it invariably wouldn't be. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, this is... The, they had an unbelievable Cruiserweight division. Phenomenal yeah. stuff. Um, the the so, only other thing that uh, I had noted about this match was, man, every time I see the cruiserweights and they're taking those insane bumps, I'm reminded of just how stiff the wrestling rings in the 90s were. Like, they are yeah. landing on these rings and there is, like, it's not budging. It's not it's giving. Just it's not bouncing. It's just, yeah. <laughs> just hopping off it. So after this match, we had um, an interesting segment with someone I didn't expect to be there, Stevie Richards and Raven, obviously. So Raven had, was, had debuted, but not really debuted in WCW because he'd just come over from ECW. Stevie Richards was there, and you do forget that Stevie Richards and Raven are like linked in a lot of ways because Stephen Richards would do so much in WWE without Raven that it's kind of like wiped at that part of his career i don't know if that's like that for you but for me when i see stevie richards i associate him with the blue meanie and then i associate him with right to censor not yeah, so much right to censor Raven. yeah is the, is the one for me yeah not, yeah but it's like you were saying earlier the flock was what about me what about yeah. Raven? like the frock was all about raven it wasn't really but the the others who were in it i'm uh, i'm interested to get your opinion on raven's promo here because <laughs> it reminded me of uh another wrestler that you hold in very high regard so i'm interested to hear your take on raven's promo i i don't t- look raven's one of the best promos ever right he really is his wcw run is not good <laughs> and by not good i mean it it, it is a spectacular misfire because it could have been great, but he was never going to get above where he is. When you see yeah. Raven now, yeah. that's where it begins, and that's kind of where it ends for him. Um, he never really gets above that. He wins a couple of belts here and there, but it, he's never going to be top of the card, because obviously Hogan's there, and no one's going to be top of the card that isn't Hogan. Um, so he gets get stuck in this, and then in WDB he goes off, and you know that's another misfire in another way but there are some big big moments there it wouldn't be until he went to tna where we got this kind of raven back and yeah, kind of yeah. worked for him so well, yeah I, like, I was, the, pro- the I was, promo it's, the promo itself it it well, didn't it didn't fit i liked well, I, it but it didn't fit i i thought you'd like it so i, I actually wrote it down he says a uh, trust and hate love and fate and i don't understand social grace the human race confuses me these words i speak bring forth the world of emotions of dreams lost dreams found and dreams i'll never see so it is written so it shall come to pass and i was sitting there going he's gone full bray wyatt full bray wyatt (laughs) it's just full bray wyatt (laughs) it's like traffic thunder you never go full bray wyatt (laughs) but see the thing about it is it's like again Ray Wyatt wouldn't have worked in WCW. Just like, like if we're if we're if we're going with the the, the tried and true comparison, if WCW is AEW, Bray Wyatt would have never worked there. Raven yeah. wouldn't work in AEW either. But TNA, this would fit right in. This this yeah. there would be a nice spot for this, you know, right there beside Joe Henry, you know, and you, and you you could do it. But and in WWE to an extent as well, if there's belief in it, but. Because we just watched the match, that actually two matches where it was all go, and the next match is all go as well. It just it's just weird because they're out next to a beach set. And you're like, <laughs> I like the promo, Raven, but this doesn't fit here. It doesn't <laughs> make any sense. <laughs> you it should is, be in the back in a in, a, is, bo- in a boiler room, you know? Yeah, it is. It is flip flops and, and sunglasses and Hawaiian shirt talking about <laughs> dreams lost and broken. It's like, ah oh, man, you're at the beach. Cheer up for one, for one show. Yeah. <laughs> it just, look, as I said, it, he wouldn't hit an environment that worked for Raven, for this Raven character, because like, look, I love Raven. He's on my bookily list, right? Absolutely. Even oh, though, same here. Yeah. Even, even though he was a multi-time 
NWA and TNA champion still, come on. Um, he never changed his character. He had to wait for the company to change for him. And that's why it never worked in WDB. It's why it never worked in WCW. It, it only worked in TNA because he was there early enough to be like, oh, here's the Raven spot. Where it's like, <laughs> you know, you know, like early TNA was built around two people, Jeff Jarrett and Raven. And it works because of that, you know, um, and it just WCW just it didn't make sense. It was like, OK, man, you could have said anything else. <laughs> that would have got you over with the crowd who don't really know who you are. And you just say nonsense. You know who got over more in that promo with the crowd? Steve Richards. Steve Richards, yeah. <laughs> so was He actually like, okay. was genuinely very funny in it. He was, yeah. but Because he was doing something that fit in with the show, you know. So from there, we have the Steiner Brothers. Genuinely one of the best tag teams of all time. Like, honestly, every time you see them more, you're like, these guys are unreal. And it's weird because Scott Steiner doesn't look like Scott Steiner. And it's so weird. I need a documentary on the various stages of Scott Steiner. Like, <laughs> at each stage of his life, he looks like a completely different person. Oh, completely I, different. Yeah. I'm getting the Avril Lavigne theory. I think multiple times he's been uh, assassinated and replaced. <laughs> and then they were like, but the replacement doesn't look at and like him. Ah, it doesn't matter. It's wrestling. Stick him out there. Give him another tattoo. People will be confused by how bad the tattoo is. It's fine. Um, <laughs> they go against, frankly, a tag team I was not expecting. The Great Muda and Masahiro Chono, which is, come on, the Great Muda is there. Like, <laughs> another one the Great Muda there. The Great Muda is there. With his face painted black and oh. NWO written across it. Because it's NWO Muda. Yeah. <laughs> it's it was wild. Um but yeah, look, this match the peak the also uh, great mood is like ring gear, like walking out gear. Super cool. Can I just say that? Like yeah. it's badass. Claus. Uh Scott Steiner again, he doesn't look like himself. He has a little like ponytail, which is so bizarre. <laughs> and and he's in a he's in his in between stage between like a a limber athlete from Steiners in the WWF to absolute genetic freak. Genetic freak. Yeah. <laughs> you uh, know. I, I look as much as I love Scott Steiner as a single athlete. The Steiners are unreal. F- fantastic. And like, come on, one of the best tag teams of all time. Like, and he, it 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 is really kind of credit to them because they would break out so comprehensively. As single stars, when they go, you know what they are? They're like, they're like a, a bigger Motor City Machine Guns, where the tag team is always going to be a tag team that you say the one of the best tag teams of all time. And then when they go single, they completely redefine themselves as single stars. Um, and yeah, I, I think what, what what helps there is that they are so identifiable as a tag team, but then so different as a as single stars. You know, yeah. like even like obviously Rick Steiner's transformation into the dogface gremlin isn't quite as extreme no, as Big Papa Pump. Um but he still sort of set out his own his own identity. I suppose if you're moving from a really famous, really well known tag team, in order to break out of just being half of that team than being your own person, you have to go with something completely different. Yeah, it's like you can either be Jeff Hardy or you can be Ma Hardy. Or you can be Willow. <laughs> or you can be Willow. <laughs> oh, yeah, God. We need to talk uh, about Willow at some point. That, <laughs> oh, I, have, I have no doubt we'll get there. Um, yeah, look, really good match. Really uh, good. Super good Like, match. never get tired of watching the Steiners suplex guys and throw them around. Always great to see Muta and Chono. And that Steiner... So I know they used to do the Steiner Bulldog and the Steiner Doomsday. This, I haven't seen this before. To well, finish it's, it's this kinda, mass, Yeah, it's kind of like a Doomsday device. Um, DDT. DDT. It yeah. is the most insane thing I've ever seen. Um, but it looks anyone, legit. It's it, like, oh, he might have killed Muda. Oh, no. Yeah, if anyone even suggested it to me, I'd say, no, I'm not doing that. My neck is not made of titanium. <laughs> There's no way in hell. I'm, so it's it's a, a doom. For anyone who hasn't seen it, it's like a do, doomsday device where 
um, they're up on uh, Rick Steiner's shoulders. But then instead of Scott Steiner diving off with a clothesline or a bulldog, he literally just climbs up on the turnbuckle and hooks your man's head and drops him down for a real, just a full spike DDT is terrifying. It is. Uh, but, you know, it got them the win. And uh, then we move yeah. on to our first. <laughs> if they had a kick out of that. <laughs> yeah, that would have been. Wrestling's over. Yeah. Oh, no. I don't even want to think about that. <laughs> the, the shark would have been over. Um, okay, so our next match is a six ta- a six man tag team match. Uh, Juventud Guerrero, Hector Gaza, Li- uh, Liz Mark Jr. defeated La Parker, Psychosis, and Villano 4. Yes. Um, so look, here's the thing about this card. It's so good. I'm not a fan of tag team wrestling being like too much on the show. It's why I can't, I can't, I couldn't stand Survivor Series up until very recently where they did the the war games. Yeah. So, you no, know, I agree with you. Yeah. The, I, I, I think like for pay per views, it should be single matches or something a bit more um, well, certainly creative. Have your multi-man or whatever but absolutely it, it but should be a one or like it was there was one of the issues i had with um all, all in last in. year yeah. was that there was ah, there was maybe one or two too many multi-mans on it and the only reason why i don't like them is because the way this the modern style is it's like they just tag they have a match or whatever and there's no real creativity we haven't seen that on this show all the tag team matches so far have actually been really really creative and really really good they weren't just oh yeah go out there and kill 10 minutes no no it's, it's been real, and, and different styles you know yes, the the so. mortis and wrath match was good but in a different way from the steiners match you know um but that that that's what i mean that like it's unfortunate that this style was lost um i think aw can get close sometimes um tna their tag team division would be more. Um, it, it would, they would. It's very similar to the Steiners, actually. The, the way the Steiners would work. That's how um, the big guys who were in tag teams would work. And then you'd have um, a more cruiserweight kind of approach with the the X the ex division guys. Um, so you never. I don't think any company had this lockdown as well. E- even today, they still don't. Uh, when they're like, no, this is how you do tag team wrestling. It, it needs to be its own kind of thing. And inside it. It's creative, you know. That's one thing that I really, really like love about WCW. All the different divisions are divisions that are wrestled in their own way. So it's not just oh, yeah. it's going to be a hardcore match. Um, I think, I think it's going to be like that. Part, you know? I think part of that comes down to Eric Bischoff only caring about the the top of the show and yeah, the lads just going off and doing what they want. Yeah, it was allowed to go out and just do your own thing. Like uh, so, yeah, the. the Obviously, the Mexican wrestlers all got together and said, all right, let's do this. You know, the tag guys all said, let's do this. You had the likes of Chris Jericho having tremendous creative freedom, not because the company had a philosophy around creative freedom, but because <laughs> Bischoff and the likes of only cared about Hogan and Nash and the NWO. And it's funny you mentioned that, actually. I think that's probably more true than not, because way we would see the opposite of that, about three years later, when Russo comes in and heavily books everything, and it just becomes this sludge that's all the same. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's very much uh, same story, same kind of grabby um, car crash stuff, but just with different wrestlers. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, that's that's a that's a really good point. So this match again, like it's it's very fast paced. Uh, I'm really glad that Parker was here, particularly because we talked about him earlier on in the show, and it was nice to just be able to be like, "Oh, look, there he is!" Um, and he know. pulls it out. He's he's great in this. He's great. Like, but they're all great. Like, they're all great. Huma yeah. Guerrero is like, you know, he's not damaged. He's not injured. Same with Psychosis. So they're all like yeah. really, really fresh. And again, like this is this is early into uh, WCW's real high period, and it would last for most of 1997 until. Ironically, up until the Montreal school job, and, and then it would start going down. But like, if you're looking, if you're watching this and going, "Oh, WCW is bad," um, 
watch 1997 WCW and then come back to us because it's yeah. you're going to have probably some of the best wrestling you've ever seen. But look, uh, Juventud Guerrero, Hector Gaza, and Liz and Liz Mark Jr. would get the win. And we're going to have to leave it there, folks, for the, oh. the, for the radio. And it's just as well, because the next match is Chris Benoit versus the Taskmaster, and there's there's a whole lot of lore there. So we are going to, if, 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 that's, if that doesn't entice you, I don't know what will, folks. <laughs> so if you're listening to us on Phoenix 92.5 FM, thank you so much. Please go over to nerdtoknowmedia.com or nerdtoknowmedia on YouTube. Subscribe to the channel. Leave your comments. Because um, this is going to go up on, on YouTube, so you can comment on what we talked about right there. And um, again, send in your bookly list, go over to Patreon. We'll be back next week. don't know what we're going to talk about, but we'll, we'll figure something out. Um, we will announce it on our social media, Nair to Know Media on Instagram, Facebook, or you can go over to The Wrestling Rewind on on Facebook or underscore The Rewind on Twitter. Martin, is there anything you want to plug before we get out of there? ba da ba da ba da ba da I second that one. Uh, <laughs> we'll be back next week, guys, here on Phoenix 92.5 FM. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to a Nerd to Know Media production. You are listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. All right, folks, we are back here on nerdtoknowmedia.com, the True Penny channel, and of course, YouTube. Please subscribe if this is your first time checking us out or leave your comments below or do both. That'd be awesome too. Um, let us know what you'd like to cover. But we are halfway through WCW's Bash at, Bash at the Beach 1997. And we're just about to start getting into the deep lore. We have <laughs> Chris Benoit defeating the Taskmaster with Jacqueline and Jimmy Hart. This is a retirement match. So obviously... If you lose, you retire. And ta- the Taskmaster is Kevin Sul- uh, Sullivan, who is obviously a fair bit older than, than Chris Benoit. So. I, I was thinking uh, yeah. a, a, a loser leaves or, or a career match between the hot young upstart and uh, the guy who it looks like at certain stages he's having trouble walking. Um, <laughs> it's a bit like a, a hair versus hair match between, you know, like Goldberg and anyone with hair like there's only there's only one way this is going you literally beat me to it i was going to use that exact oh yeah Yeah, i was going to say it's (laughs) like a hair versus hair match with like edge and a balding uh kurt angle it's like come on (laughs) exactly (laughs) what are you doing like (laughs) Like, no you beat me you beat me right to it i was going to use that exact analogy um yeah nobody was under any doubt as to what way this is going now if you are new to wrestling or not even new to wrestling if you just weren't aware of this match or these two guys you would see an incredibly vicious incredibly hard hitting brilliant stiff match yeah if you're aware of the the backstory the reason for that is um so chris benoit and kevin sullivan had serious legitimate heat with each other uh, there was a storyline that kevin sullivan pushed he was the one who pushed it where he in wrote story it. yeah in story chris benoit would basically steal his wife and um you know he'd be on the show like mocking him you know shifting his wife and whatever else and then in real life oh Chris Benoit and his wife started uh, started seeing each other behind uh, Kevin Sullivan's back. So there's there's legitimate um, kind of uh, Edge Mahardy. Yeah, it's the Edge Mahardy <laughs> thing years before. Yeah, uh, and it makes sense. Like this, now I know it's also these guys' style, but this is a stiff match. 
Yeah, like obviously in the ring it's quite stiff, but it starts off with an outside brawl where they just destroy most of the set themselves. <laughs> but well, just, that would be e- awesome. Either hitting each other with it or just throwing each other into it. And I've never seen that before where they legitimately go in and destroy the set halfway through. Like, yeah, they'll probably do it near the end or, you know, it, to, to transition over. Like when the old SmackDown set was gored by Rhino and then we had the new set. But to just do it as part of a match, oh, I've was, never seen that before. Yeah, it was fantastic. And I mean, they trashed this set. Um, one of the things I absolutely love about wrestling back then, and it's it's oh, it's one of the top things I wish they'd bring back, is... Actual really, sets. really unique individual, yeah, physical yeah. pay per view sets. But I get they, um, why I get why they don't. Um, yeah, it's, but, but particularly from seeing WrestleMania, the seat that I was at, I could see all the backstage stuff. Um, it's a lot easier to like do the modern presentation, particularly of WWE. And even when I was at All In, the seat I was at as well, I could see from behind. It makes a lot of sense. Because they're doing like the big graphics and they're doing the the fireworks and stuff. Yeah, but I, at the same time, yeah, I, I same, get it. You know, I I, I, I agree with you one hundred percent. But it's just the presentation of it because, like, if you're looking at this show or even WWE, uh, two or three years later, they only did fireworks for like four people, and you know it was a lot easier to move it around. But now you have a lot more moving parts, and obviously Evan has the phone, so they're not going to be like, oh look, there's some lad with the moving this to there. It's just yeah. cleaner, but. <laughs> Yeah, no, look, 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 I I I get it. I hate it. Even in terms of logistics, I'm sure it's probably more money than it's worth to hire a truck to cart, you know, the bash at the beach. Sand. Sand around the country or the, (laughs) you know, we have to pay to store the Halloween Havoc pumpkin somewhere for for the whole year. Like, Well, see, they still are. That's what's all sitting in a warehouse somewhere up up near WWE. That's what's crazy about it. I mean, I, I get it, but I... I miss physical sets so much just for the really made pay-per-views feel special. Yes. But also because you have uh, moments like this, like these yeah, two guys destroy each other and destroy this set. Well, think about it, right? Like one of the things that we're talking about on this very throwaway match, but it's not throwaway. It's a very, very good match, but like compared to everyone else, we're talking about that. That's a show stealer. That oh is yeah, a show stealer. Oh, absolutely. Like for me, one of the one of the highlights of not only this match, one of the highlights of the entire show for me, and even now, years later, like I, I'll add this into my kind of a retcon bank of WCW memories. Like whenever I think of WCW, this will be one of the memories I have now. Is a uh, Jimmy Hart climbing up on the. Um, on the lifeguard seat <laughs> to the really high lifeguard seat <laughs> and Benoit just turning around and pushing it over and Jimmy Hart just disappearing into this mess of like broken tables and surfboards and parasols and umbrellas and oh phenomenal stuff I one of my favorite moments of the match is not not long before that when uh, Benoit is just thrown into the surfboards and they all break yeah. and I don't know if they were gimmicked or not. I I would say they probably weren't. So how hard did Kevin Sullivan throw him into that? Yeah, probably I don't very... think I don't think they were gimmicked because shortly after the uh, the spot with, in fact, immediately after the spot with Jimmy Hart, so Benoit pushes the lifeguard chair over and and knocks Jimmy Hart out into the ether. Um, he turns around and Sullivan swings and i mean swings a surfboard at benoit's head and it makes this horrible like thonk sound yeah i don't think they were gimmicked that's and the it just thing. bounces yeah. off him it doesn't break it doesn't bend it's not like a a jeff jarrett guitar or anything it just <laughs> thonks him on the head and bounces off oh it's too funny it's well i mean it's it's funny because it's so Unlike anything you see nowadays, you know, it's it's up there with um I know we've talked about him before, but it's up there with Shane McMahon and Kurt Angle when they have that match with the real glass and it's not real. <laughs> it, it wasn't supposed to be real, but they're like, we'll just do it anyway. Uh and I think that's kind of the mentality here. But well, that was to give the show. This was because they legitimately hate each other and like, I don't care. <laughs> you 
Um, so, the other thing, so like, okay, we could give you a blow by blow of this, but if you're going to go back and watch any of these shows, like this is one of the matches to watch. But the other thing that's notable about it is um, the Taskmaster comes out with Jackie. Yes. And man, Jackie is tough. She, she is there to work. She's there to around. work. Yeah. 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 Like this isn't like a, like a, a diva or a manager who, you know, takes like an errant, you know, bump, you know, from a, you know, an Irish whip uh, to get bump, banged into or whatever. She gets battered from pillar to post in this match. And well, here's the thing. Great. That's what Jackie does. Oh, there's, yeah. a re- there's a reason she got so, she got so involved in the hardcore division in WWE, and you know even in, as a woman's champion, she was <laughs> Jackie would kill you. Like, but then in in, w- in uh, TNA, she would be out there with um, Cowboy James Storm, and it would be the the same kind of thing. So, but it was great to see even this far back, 1997, she was still doing it. And the end of this match actually is good thing you bring her up because the end of this match actually comes with a uh, turn on the Taskmaster. Where she hits him with a, of all things, a, a beach chair. <laughs> yeah, like a wooden, a, a wooden, wooden deck chair. chair. Again, don't think it was all that gimmicked, and she so swings it at him. Um, I think that was the only. You know, I, I think I thought the ending was kind of weak, but it was. Uh, yeah, it was. only maybe in hindsight. Uh, I think at the time I was okay with it, but what happens now is. The next two or three matches have a end with like kind of a manager yeah. turning, and it's like oh, he did this three times in a row now. Like you know, kind of sullied it. Like don't don't book three manager turns in a row. You know. So well, okay, we'll get to it. We'll get to it because I, I'm not as upset with the next one as as I would be with you know with the others. But so I we have. Why. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Steve McMichael, who never looked like. I mean, isn't it so weird that that was a character? He just because obviously he was he was a football player for the Bears, I think, and he he's coming out just wearing the Bears stuff, and it's like okay, uh, I don't know, Mon- Mongo. It's just a weird character, but then he's coming out with Queen Deborah McMichael, and obviously, you know, if you want to put it together, Deborah would then become the Queen Deborah would become Deborah, and then she would become. Jeff Jarrett's Deborah, and then she would become uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin's Deborah and such. Um, but yeah, so Jeff Jarrett comes out; he's the US champion at the time, and he is no different <laughs> than he is in WWE uh, in nope. his his Bookly run. He's still wearing the the same gear, the same or similar a, music. He has a, a touch of the old Raven about him. <laughs> it's just this is my gimmick. <laughs> I this refuse my gimmick. to change. <laughs> Work around me. <laughs> this is what it is. I say, like, hey, we got a great storyline for you. You're gonna be top of the card. It's gonna be like you're gonna win the world title. You're gonna. He's like, do I get to wear a plaid shirt tied around my waist? Then I don't want to hear about it, <laughs> sir. You can come to me. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what I said. TNA and uh, TNA was built around two people who fundamentally wouldn't move. So they had to make a company that would move around them. Raven, Raven? and Jeff Jarrett, and that's. And that's true. I mean, when you think about it, it's like, yeah, they were great, but the company had to form around them. And, you know, you see here with Jeff Jarrett where he had a chance to start completely fresh and he didn't. <laughs> he's like, nope, no. <laughs> not by new ring gear. It's the exact he, He's same. the definition of, I am not the problem here. <laughs> it's like, keep getting fired from all these companies, but it's them. <laughs> it's, it's not me. No. no, it's the kids who are wrong. It's the kids. No, it's all the international promotions who are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing of it is, I, I'm so shocked because it's like, obviously Jeff Jarrett left and we were doing the In Your House arc and where he disappeared and it was a sad day for everybody. Um, and, you know, you would think, okay, maybe he's fed up with creative, you know, giving him the stupid gimmick, blah, blah, blah. And then he shows up in WCW, does the same gimmick. And you're like, then what was the problem, Jeff? Why, why did you leave? <laughs> It's just so, so bizarre, you know, but he would eventually leave and go back to WWE and have his arguably most controversial, but also the gimmick that kind of got him over to most people uh, in WWE. And then he'd come back and do the slap nuts thing, which, you know, hey, look, Jeff yeah, Garrett, it, Jarrett, hey, hey, listen, we can make fun of it, but the slap nuts thing was over. Oh, I'm not making fun of it. I, I love Jeff Garrett. Twice, That's the thing. Yeah. It's so wild. I, I have to hand it to him, right? 
he is like just the guy that's like you know will not go away he's like no it's gonna happen and i i admire that because if it wasn't for that there'd be no tna so you know fair play to jeff Jarrett. but i'm i'm anytime i see him on the card i'm excited he he's the old you know what i don't care if he's the world champion he is the ultimate boogly king king boogly <laughs> king boogly that's it you know not king in the mountain king boogly that's another thing you can have <laughs> Um, he's actually very well placed in this match as well. Uh, sure. Obviously, uh, Stephen Michael is not a wrestler. I mean, he did a certain amount of training, but he was a footballer and he came in because he had a level of celebrity. You know what's cool, football. though? You know what's cool, though? Like, his, his ring attire, even though it's like, it's kind of terrible, but it's kind of not. It just works. Oh, well, it work, may, work. Yeah, it works for him, yeah. But it makes him look a bit like a jobber. You know, it's like... You know, he, he didn't put that much effort into it. He's like, oh, yeah. I have some shorts, you know. Nondescript cool. black shorts. <laughs> yeah, and he's just like, okay. <laughs> if he had a, I think if he had to put a bit more effort into it, he could have had something, but I think he was there, as you said, for the celebrity more than anything else. Yeah, like, so this is not... Uh, kind of in two minds, this is by no means a great match, but no. Mongo McMichael's a celebrity. It's only six minutes long. It's full of nonsense shenanigans and uh it's actually one of the matches of the night that really benefits from dusty Rhodes's commentary so even though like if you were to judge this by like i don't know like a Meltzer star rating or something it's not very good but on this show you know we've had we've had the great wrestling we've had cool technical stuff we've had hard, like the high flying matches we've had the hard hitting um tag stuff yeah, and now we get a, a wee bit of nonsense. I but the thing about, fine with this. But the thing about the nonsense here was this was to build up the fact that Deborah now has moved to Jeff Jarrett. And she would stay with Jeff Jarrett for about another three years, two years at least, before he, he would he would yeah. leave WWE. So, I mean, this is Deborah's origin story with Jeff Jarrett. So, I mean... Yeah. Yeah, while it was a dusty finish or whatever, it made sense because she's like, oh, I'm going to ditch this loser without, and go with Jeff Jarrett. Yeah, without this moment, without her hitting Steve McMichael with, a, what is it, like a briefcase or something? Briefcase, yeah. Yeah, without her hitting Steve McMichael with a briefcase, Stone Cold Steve Austin doesn't get to beat her several years later. So, <laughs> I, was, I, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, we wouldn't have Jerry the King Lawler screaming puppies. Oh, we wouldn't have that. Eh? <laughs> no. Do you know what? I think even if wrestling had never existed, Jerry the King Laura would have been walking around Memphis, <laughs> homeless, <laughs> stone drunk, you know, wearing a cardboard box, screaming puppies. So I think that's one of those just uh, destinies that was going to happen. No Nexus, matter next yeah, events. <laughs> no matter what alternate reality we entered. So from there. We have a commercial, and then we have uh, a just confusing promo that Hulk Hogan and, and Rodman are backstage, and Rodman's holding the belt for some reason, even though he's never going to win it. Uh, look, I don't like Hulk Hogan. That's, that's a known thing, right? I really don't. I think he's a stain on, on wrestling and humanity as a whole. Um, I, I, and, you know, one of my greatest achievements in life is being blocked by Hulk Hogan on Twitter. So Did you see his promo this weekend. Uh, no, no, we're not. No, we're not even getting into that. I just mean <laughs> that's, that's, he, a, that's, that's a whole other thing. On that's, own. that's a whole other thing. We're not getting into that. I mean, even at this point, right? Hulk Hogan is is the worst part of the show. However, like uh, for me, I just the minute I see him, I'm like, I I hate him. I just I just I I, I just do not like Hulk Hogan, right? As a wrestler, just despite the you know. From what he's done in the ring or whatever, I just don't I just don't see the appeal, right? However, that being said, this is super over. This is like Oh, this is wild. Wildly over. The crowd love it. Like you can hear the the pro look as they're doing the promo, the crowd are super into it. It it, it does come off as being a big deal. The NWO I, like I the NWO we, style works here a lot too, you know, it really I does. I think we take and like it's obviously it's only natural, but I think we take a lot of our modern day views on Hogan based on what we've learned over the no, past. No, 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 hold on. I want to be very clear here. I've always hated Hulk Hogan. Oh, you've never been. All right. Okay. No, I've never been a Hulkamaniac. I'm like, I hate Hulk. And I, I watched WCW. I love WCW. And I still was like, I hate Hulk Hogan. 
why is he in the NWO? He, I always thought he was the worst part of the NWO. But no, I hear your point, and you are right in that sense. I think a lot of people are like that too. But I want to be very clear here, folks. I've never liked Hulk Hogan. <laughs> so, Sarah is nothing if not consistent. <laughs> really? Um, Hulk, Hulk Hogan, for me, was the first Well, uh, Cody Rhodes. Ap- where, <laughs> or first well, John Cena, where I'm like, no, go on. Ap- apart from Dara, <laughs> everyone, everyone else in 1997 was... Well, was a Hulkamaniac. Like, this is mad over. Like, yeah, yeah, no, and it is. And look, it was smart. Like, Dennis Rodman at the time as well, I think it's important to bring this up. You know, he was very controversial in basketball because he was, like, kind of a heel, like, on yeah. the court. So to bring him in there with, like, the NWO, which, look, for comparison, for, for, for reference even, right, if you wear an NWO hat in Florida now, you will get too sweeted by everybody. I was walking, I was over there, um, started year in, tw- in 2024, and I got too sweeted by so many security guards working in Florida. <laughs> One of them let me through security and was like, it's okay, he's with the NWO and then Wolf Pack for Life. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is insane. Uh, I was, and then the other day I was in a bar in, in Dublin and so I was wearing an NWO shirt and I forgot I was wearing an NWO shirt and somebody comes over and like hugs me and he's like, NWO for life, brother. I'm like, what? What is going on? <laughs> this is a twenty-year-old thing. This is so. Yeah, it, if, it just if, goes to show it really people really uh, connected with it. It's, well, here's the, you know what? It's the, the it's the late nineties thing. It's the no, but the point I'm making now, Martin, right, is that's what it's like now, right? Where those those people, right, and it's always dudes. Women don't really care about the end of you. Um, it's still a thing for them, right? Can you imagine what this was like? Oh, then? just like, can you imagine what that's like then? Where it's just like, yeah, okay, there's still pitch, these like, fever pitch, like wildly over, and like the, the the numbers that this stuff was drawn was like six million, seven million viewers a week. Holy yeah. hell! Holy yeah. hell! Uh, like, and that's six million, seven million viewers on one show. And yeah. then maybe another four or five million viewers on the other show. Like, yeah. Even on a no, bad day. This like, is... Like, four million on a bad day? Like, come on. That's... Yeah. Like, there's there's no denying. And, like, we'll get to the main event match. Um, and, again, it's another one of those things. Like, I don't think anyone was expecting a technical classic. Mm. But it's so over. The crowd are so hot for it. It's, it's, it's kind of hard, actually, not to get into it. Yeah, like, and the thing about it is, is, like, even though again, I don't like Hogan. You can, if there's one thing consistent, you're like, you know, Dara hates Co- uh, Cody Rhodes as Cody Rhodes, <laughs> Hulk Hogan and John Cena as a wrestler, right? They, they are they are consistent in every timeline, no matter where we're going. Yeah, but at, you know, it's like, but the thing, yeah, it's like the alternate reality with puppies. It's it's just <laughs> happening. No it matter. just happens. <laughs> like again, it's it's one of those things. But and I think he's the worst part of the NWO, but. The NWO, I don't think, benefit from Hulk Hogan as much as Hulk Hogan benefit from the NWO. Because oh, definitely. Even though Hogan is doing as much as he can to still be Hulk Hogan, the NWO aura just kind of gives him, okay, look, this is relatively fresh, you know, compared to like Hall, uh, even Macho Man as well, who's, you know, is not as bad as Hogan by still just being the Macho Man. Uh, you have Hall and Nash kind of carrying the NWO banner where it's like, okay, they're actually trying something. And then you have Hogan being like, I'm still Hulk Hogan. It's like, no, you're not. You're the NWO, you know? And there is that kind of like dynamic that's still there. But because the the NWO dynamic is so strong and set in its ways, it overshadows everything else, which is good. But then it also would lead to being bad. And we haven't got to the bad yet. So that is an important Hogan, thing to remember. Hogan would have... If not for the, like, I actually completely agree with you on the NWO. Hogan would have become a joke if yeah. not for the NWO. Absolutely, because yeah. if he's you see, really hard, he's trying really hard to to still be a joke. Oh, but, if you see any of those documentaries about, like, uh, you know, the Monday Night Wars or whatever, like, Hogan had to be, like, talked into this yeah. turn. Like, and even when he was going out there, he, like, they were backstage going, we literally don't know if he's even going to do it or not yeah. um, like he genuinely thought he could just keep the Hulkamania thing going forever uh, and he would have been especially when crowds got a wee bit smarter and started to expect a wee bit more in the late 90s man he would have been 
discarded as like a a relic of the 80s you know he would have been become like an absolute joke completely agree it, the like, nwo would exist without hogan but hogan would not exist without the nwo to, to put a very fine point on this the way people perceive hulk hogan now is the way how people would have perceived hogan without the nwo <laughs> it's another, so, that's the truth it's another reality consistent you know, in all that's, reality that's the truth you know, like if the NWO was still around today, Hogan probably would have been restrained by Hall and Nash. Been like, listen, maybe, maybe don't, <laughs> maybe Hall, don't. Hall and you Nash know. go to, him, hey man, have you ever considered turning face? I think you'd be, <laughs> I think you'd be a great baby face. <laughs> um, but yeah, the speaking of the NWO, we had Randy Savage and Scott Hall, which is a tag team that you don't necessarily see that much. And it, like, obviously, Hall's walking out with the tag team belts because. Even though it's a tag team match, the tag team champions aren't defending it because Nash isn't on this show. Um, so you have all just with the belts, which is like, why does... I think Nash was the champion. Why doesn't he have the belt? What's, yeah, well, why not? He, well, it's like, here, have my belt. I don't want to carry it around. It's too heavy. Um, yeah. They defeat um, Kurt Hennig and, and DDP. This match is actually really, really good. And here's so, the thing. Right, so hold on. I just want to say one thing real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Most of this show is tag team matches. And it's phenomenal yeah well credit. It's, it credit. is but because each one is kind of different each one is is kind of its own thing yeah. i gotta say uh man I, I really really enjoyed this show so uh this happened in 1987 it's 2024 so what's that 97,017. like it's good 27 years later um and through the whole the whole way through the show, there's wee uh, skits where DDP is saying, um, I'm not going out there on my own tonight. I got a secret partner. I got a surprise partner, blah, blah, blah. And people are, you know, kind of, um, you know, giving their suspicions about who it might be. Mm. DDP comes out and he turns around and Kurt Hennig comes out. And 27 years later, on my couch, I popped. I did the same thing. Man, I look I look I, popped for this like um so it's even so, though i i didn't actually think this match was that great i thought it was very sports entertainmenty. there was a lot of appealing to the crowd and playing up to the crowd yeah but look who's in it but look who, it's the macho it's, man, yeah exactly is the it was savage hall ddp and then heading like yeah i like, had a great time with this yeah no it was these guys were like the te- the beating heart of WCW, like and to be fair, a lot of the problems that would have existed that did exist with WCW weren't in this ring uh, at this point. Uh, yeah. You know, it would be what would happen in the main event that that would be there. Uh, but yeah, look, Kurt Hennig, obviously one of the best of all time. It's 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 it is a shame that he's dead. It's a shame that he didn't get the run that he should have got when he came back to WWE. But um. We we have this, you know, and we have this phenomenal yeah. like and time look, period. I suspect that maybe uh, Hall and Hennig. I suspect that maybe they weren't uh, fully recovered or fully able to go, because um, like I say, a lot of this match is stuff other than wrestling. Yes, <laughs> there's a ridiculous spot actually where um, where DDP and Savage. Um, spit at each other like Savage spits at DDP <laughs> and then DDP is like what the hell he just spits back at Savage and then they tag out and Hall gets in the ring and walks up to Hennig and he flicks his toothpick at Hennig's face <laughs> and Hennig <laughs> spits in his face and I'm like what the hell is going on but the thing about it is it's because these guys are such big names and they're legit names like even though DDP was the only real WCW guy there because he was yeah. like homegrown and obviously this was early enough into his run. Uh, he doesn't have the the credentials that anyone else in the ring would have. He's still out there with the best of them. You know, like it's it's one of the best um, snapshots of like top tier WCW ever is, is this tag team match. Oh, it's, and it, it's, it's yeah. great. Like it's brilliant. And DDP, the crowd love him. He is their hero. And uh, I love that even when he gets thrown out at certain points, uh, the, uh, like he's still just like, no, I'm I'm gonna get thrown back in, 
Kurt Hennig is a great foil for him. It's weird to see Macho Man work so heelish, um, but he's great in it. So this this whole thing was was very entertaining. The commentary, I will admit, was very grating. Um, yeah, Dusty, is, Dusty Rhodes just needs to shut up <laughs> at this point. Though needs to come in and out for specific matches. Yeah, at, at this point, I was just like, I I can't anymore. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. Oh, and have, this is the. So this match again ends in Dusty another <clears throat> managerial betrayal. I was like, oh, it's like, well, it ends with a managerial betrayal, but also you know, Kurt Hennig walks away because he would join the NWO very soon after this. Yeah. But, it, but but I will have to say, I will have to say on that, it was to build up a story, and the story was the continual creep of the NWO making Diamond Dallas Page the one of the lone faces against the big heels. So yeah. it, I look, mean, it kind of, sometimes it's a little bit unfair when we review these pay-per-views kind of in isolation, because you're not well, looking at the build up or the aftermath. Well, look, the book and philosophy here at this point was they'd use the pay-per-views to build to nitros, which yeah. I don't think, which I don't think is a look. It's not, that I don't think it's, it's been proven as a bad idea, but if you, if you want to see how successful this was, look at the ring after that It was covered with garbage and you had to clear it out before the next, <laughs> yeah. before the next match. So it did work. It, it, it built severe heat and that would actually build into the main event where Savage would come out and the crowd would be booing the hell out of him again. So <clears throat> it was successful. Did it, it, was it satisfying to watch in isolation? Absolutely no way. But we'd go into our next match. It's one of the one of the only like pure singles matches of the night. I think there's only three on this card. It's uh, Roddy Piper defeating Ric Flair by technical submission in 40 minutes. Uh, Roddy Piper looks great, and he, he like obviously he's a lot I'm younger, re- but he would look really surprised. Yeah, really surprised at this. Ric Flair. It's it's amazing how much Ric Flair aged in five years. <laughs> Honest to God, he looks like a different person in 1987 than he did. Even five years later, where he looks like a zombie. Yeah. And guess what? He's still wrestling. Despite heart attacks in the ring. Go, Rick. Because you're not going to listen to sense. No. Yeah. So his, uh, like, just some modern day stuff. His, he had that drinks deal with AEW where they would promote his, um, his uh, woo energy drink. And uh, that's finished now. So, yeah, there is speculation that he might end up back with, uh, you know, WWE for one, one last, I don't know, like a managerial thing or, but did, did you hear what he pitched? Go on. Uh, for Revolution, you know, St- Sting's last match um, yes. uh, earlier this year at Revolution, that insane, incredible match for just unbelievable bumps for a man of his age, intense high drama, and then this just outpouring of love from the crowd, you know, giving him a send off. Flair pitched that at the end of all that, he would come in the ring and turn on Sting. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, Tony <laughs> Khan, apparently, Tony Khan said, Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. We'll give you a call about that and never called him again. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody needs to save Ric Flair from himself. <laughs> Honestly. Honestly, it's. <laughs> Look, again, we talk about consistency on this show. Ric Flair will always be Ric Flair. Uh, always. You know? Always be Ric Flair. Um, but, you know, when you see... This? Like, it, it's truly bizarre, though, to see him in 1997, and then you see him in, like, 2002, and you're like, what the hell? Yeah. What happened? It was this and, shambling corpse. You know, and he, he he was less of a shambling corpse, but, like, now when you see him, you're like, oh, my God, like, this is... But Roddy Piper... Phenomenal in this. Um, I, I really liked how this match was uh, very much the hunt for the submission. It was the hunt to see who can make the other guy tap out. They weren't going for pins here. Uh, like, really? There'd be one or two, but it was more just kind of like, no, we're going to beat each other up to get submissions here. You know, it was the tail of the tape here was, oh, I'm not just going to try to get the pin. If I get it, I get it. But it's more like, no, you're going to you're gonna quit. You know? And yeah, there's a real... Um old school almost end of year feel to, to this was. match like Piper came awesome. out oh, and I did not expect this on fire yeah. like he came out like the Piper you remember 
yeah. like whenever you think of Roddy Piper, he came even, out absolutely on fire. And even when he won as well, it was like, man, you know, you could put the belt on this guy and he can have one more run. Oh, absolutely. And not even like a kind of conciliatory, well done in your career, have this for two months. No, it's, it's like, like a, a, run. No, a, a like run. A proper, um, no, this, this, I really enjoyed this match. Like I said, Piper comes out, he's all guns blazing. He's beaten the living hell out of Flair. Um, Flair flares his way back into it with, with a, a, a nice wee A poke. Mm. Um, and then he starts attacking the, the knee, you know, really mm. go, like really working that one body part. Um, we get uh, an interference, but actually a pretty cool. And so WCW latter day, one of the complaints people have is that every match ends in interference. Yeah. There's interference in this match, but it actually leads to a great spot. So um, Benoit and uh, Stephen Michael interfere. So uh, Benoit interfere on behalf of Flair. So Benoit uh, climbs up to the ring and he goes to do the Dave and Headbutt on to Roddy Piper. Roddy Piper rolls out of the way. So he ends up doing the Dave and Headbutt on Ric Flair. And the crowd pops for that. Piper turns around. He gets lifted by McMichael and dropped with a really vicious looking tombstone. And they roll out of the ring. Flair goes to the cover. You're like, this is it. A legitimately awesome kick out at two crowd pops like mad this was fantastic stuff it really was and um i, I think it was a, a nice way to kind of like get the crowd that big pop that big boost before before the main event but listen i have to call this out because this this annoyed me a fair bit so david um i'm sorry michael buffer not Bruce, uh, Bruce Buffer, but Michael Buffer annoys me a lot. And uh, it's because he got like 10 million a year to just do one bit of announcing. On oh, WCW. Uh, this, the let's get ready. Let's, to get, rumble. let's get ready to rumble. It's like they should have paid him once and then just played it every time. Because they should have gotten can you, uh, anyone so. else. Well, no, look, I get why they did it. I get like the the whole thing. It was like he was a big name. He was famous for it, he, you know. But at the same time, you're like, come on, man. He, no, he no. was famous for it, right? But he's one of those things that it's a nice thing to have. Or if you're gonna pay him a load of money, like you say, pay him once and have him come in and do it for, you know, a massive starcade main event or something. But the the way this guy, he cleaned them out. For what? Ten two million mi- years. Two two minutes work, twelve times a year. It's like, oh my god, he really like of so, all the guys who got like huge ridiculous deals in WCW. I I think his was the was the most egregious. Well, it, Hogan. So Hogan's first contract in WCW was true. Was it? I think it was. 10 million for three years, right? Yeah. Uh, he got 2 million last year in, in WWE before he jumped over to WCW. Um, and uh, Michael Buffer was like, ah, that's, that's those numbers are rookie. 10 million. Yeah. <laughs> a year. But, <laughs> yeah, was just like, oh but Hogan had to, Hogan still had to show up and wrestle. <laughs> yeah. But the thing <laughs> with it is, is like, you know, he, fair enough. He had been in some movies. He was in Rocky five, um, which was probably his biggest one. And he'd he'd have like a massive career afterwards, doing a lot of this stuff. But he did a lot of um, he worked in Trump's casinos for years, built up his um, ring announcer stuff there in the eighties. Then he was on HBO boxing, Showtime boxing. So he had all this like credentials, like real sport credentials. And yeah. I think that's how he was able to do it. But at the same time, I'm like, who? I'm gonna ask you. Watching this show, right, and knowing who it is, did that honestly add anything? Like, like, uh, no, no bullshit. Like, d- did no, he like, add anything to, to this show? Like, we're, we're I, 20, 28 years removed from this. I don't think so. Well, here's the thing. Um, I, I think he adds something to it. Like you say, he has that. Uh, but was it worth 10 million legitimacy. a year? He has that level of gravitas. Was <laughs> it worth 10 million a year? No, it's That's like I said I, earlier. It's a thing. It was nice to have 
but I wouldn't be paying for it. You know, yeah. like I don't, I doubt there's a single person ever. And I don't like to talk about the business end of things a lot because, you know, people on Twitter get mad into that and they think they're bookers and they think they're promoters. Mm. But was there a single person ever who bought a pay-per-view because he was announcing on it? Like, would would any part of the history of WCW have been changed one iota if they just had a normal, regular paid announcer? Because, like, the thing about it is, is like, as I said, you know, he had built up his, his credentials doing stuff in Vegas and then he did the big matches with, like, Evander Holyfield and Tyson and stuff like that as well. Like, yeah, that's great, but... Could he not just been like, look, we'll fly you out, we'll give you a five-star hotel, a lot of stuff will be comped, and you'll have a certain amount of money. Because he was in The Simpsons as well. I don't think The Simpsons gave him 10 million to show no. up. You know? So it's just like, how? No. He was in South Park at one point as well. And, it's like, and the thing is that while all this is happening, while all this money has been thrown around the place, while your man's been flown about everywhere, sitting backstage, twiddling his thumbs, it's mean Gene Okerlund. <laughs> like... <laughs> The greatest, just used him. The yeah. greatest wrestling announcer. Like, what, what are you doing? I just, I just don't understand it. I mean, fair enough. It works. Like, fair enough. Bruce Buffer, Bruce Buffer does the same shtick in UFC, but at least he's working the whole time. You know, he's he's not just showing up for five minutes and being like, okay, he's going to say this nonsense and then leave. I just, I had to call it out because every time I see him, I'm like, you know, we blame Hogan, rightly so. That guy was the real swindler. Oh, he, <laughs> he was. He was, the, the, he was the one the making it like a that, The worst part is that he was getting massive money for like two minutes work. And sometimes he wouldn't even put the two minutes in. Do you remember, like, we'd be watching the WCW pay-per-views and he'd introduce, ladies and gentlemen, Bart, the hitman, Hart. <laughs> like, you had, one, you had one job for two minutes. You got paid $10 million for it. He couldn't even get that right. I'd want a refund. I'm like, no, we're taking one of I'm those like, millions away. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'd be like, nah, 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 nah. Bart Hart, no. Throw, <laughs> throw, throw us one of your millions back. That's not. <laughs> but yeah, no, I just I had to call it out because I was like, there was no reason for this. Look, even if they weren't going to use Mean Gene, Mike Tanay is there. Mike Tanay's awesome. You got, my, you got Dusty Rhodes there. Like, even that would have been, you know, like, he's kind of a wrestling legend. He's got a unique voice. You know, that would have been something, like, just, they had so many options. But Jimmy like, Hart, the mouth of the South, like, anyone, literally. There you go. They, you know, they had so many options. They had the literal, like, when people talk about ring announcers, they think Mean Gene Okerlund. Yeah. He was just there. Twiddling his thumbs backstage. He was literally there. And he would have saved like, 10 million. No, we need, <laughs> a to, year. We, need to, we need to drop 10 million on this guy. Which is wild. So I mean, silly. fair play to him. Like, he he swindled them good. As I said, like, it's, you know, everyone talks about Hogan, and Hogan was, was making chump change in comparison. Yeah, and, like I said, Hogan still had to show up and wrestle. Like, yeah. you, you can say he was good or bad, but he, he had to. He still had to work for us. You know? He still had to show up. So yeah, look, the main event of this is a tag team match. And look, main main events being tag team matches are kind of cheap. Even at WrestleMania this year, with um, that was still that was probably the greatest tag team match of all time because it was full story smosh. But it was still, you know, if that had been the main event of WrestleMania, I would have been like, ah, oh, come on. Um, but at the same time, when it's done right, it can actually be done really, really well. And that's a rare occasion of it done of being done well. And this is also surprisingly, genuinely, I'm right there with you, Martin. This is the most surprising main event ever because I was expected to be like, oh god, Hogan and Rodman in there yes, with the yeah. giant and Luger. Like the only guy yeah. who can kind of go is Luger, and that's and you even know, that's he's very limited. Yeah, it's very uh, limited. Uh, but the, the, the giant worked. was at this stage of his career was was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Too. That's true as well. He 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 wasn't coming to the ring smoking cigarettes just yeah. No, <laughs> he uh, and he was taller than he was wide at that stage. So. Yeah, you know, okay. So when they walk out, Luger uh, looks like a normal person next to the giant, and you're like, "Oh, that's because Luger is massive, and the giant yeah. is even bigger." And you're like, "It's it's so weird." So like, 
again, we've said this before. While the giant and, and big show, you know, is rightly criticized, he is still a sight to behold. Oh yeah, and know, at, at this stage his, of his career, like he was pulling out them, um, like top rope moonsaults and stuff. At this stage, like he crazy. Was, yeah, you know, like he he had he had a unique look and and something to really offer. Um, yeah. But the fact that he's the the workhorse <laughs> in this match is it speaks volumes. Is why. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. But then again, even that being said, the crowd are so into it that they're like actively pelting the, the ring with with garbage. And it's oh. like maybe this is why you know when you go to a show now they're like, please do not pelt the ring. <laughs> with items uh, it's probably from this where like it's what happened the crowd were genuinely annoyed with what was going on oh yeah like you say nobody's going to judge this as an excellent wrestling match but the crowd was so hot like they barely touched for like the first five minutes there was loads of like sizing up and walking around and tests of strength and all that stuff but the crowd is so hot for it that it's <laughs> it's actually kind of kind of cool to watch um, and then when they eventually do get into it, like so the big thing is people want to see what Dennis Rodman can do in the ring. And he gets in the ring. And yeah, there's a lot of backing off and like you said, tests of strength and different stuff. And then he whips out a hip toss and you're like, is that the greatest hip toss ever? Like that was, that was amazing. Uh, and then he gets hip tossed twice in a row and he rolls out of the ring. You're like, holy hell, like I, I know I'm being worked here, but yeah, go for it. Work me. Well, again, like you have people in there who are masterminds of it. Like Hogan is the, you know, a master at that. Dennis Rodman knows what he can do and what he can't. But they're they're all workers. Like, and I don't mean that as in like they're going to go out and do Mac classics. It's like no, they're going to do as little as possible, get paid as much as possible, and then go home. And it all worked out well. But here's the surprising part, right? So obviously Lex Luger, uh, Lex and the Giant defeated Hogan and Dennis Rodman, but. It wasn't without some shenanigans. So the, the match broke down, and out comes the icon Sting to level the playing field and set up the, the finish. Taller than usual. Yes, taller and and less <laughs> less stingish. Yeah. So but it, it looked a bit. I don't know how you describe it. A bit gnashy to me. Yeah, he didn't very much look like Sting at all, even though it was supposed to be the icon Sting. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, this would obviously play into the NWO sting eventually. But yeah, there's no way that was Steve Bourne. <laughs> there's no way. No. <laughs> um, look, uh, this was pure sports entertainment. Yes. Uh, but I was sports entertained. But it was. It was great for what it was. It's very difficult not to get into these things when the crowd is rabid. Mm. Like, they are wild for this. There's so many reactions to every little, you know, like every little move, not even like big wrestling moves, every little like um, sort of a taunt or stepping outside the ring or playing to the crowd. Um, Rodman, look, a lot of the times when you get a, a celebrity in, the most you can hope for is that it's not a disaster, that it's not, you know, like a Snoop Dogg level embarrassing Rodman's greatness he, like you say he knows what he can't do which is most things but which is most things <laughs> but the, the three or four things he can do man he he does them well and he and he knows when to do them and how to milk them and um I thought the interesting thing about this show as a whole is that the second half of it is very sports entertainment heavy very uh, celebrity appearance heavy. Mm. Um, kind of a lot of the stuff that WWE is known for now. Mm. Uh, but at the same, not at the same time, but WWF's pay-per-view uh, in this month in 97 was Canadian Stampede. So they yeah. put on an actual, a really in-ring, uh, mat based uh, wrestling-focused show. Which I just thought was like an interesting kind of uh, sort of role reversal there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So look, um, what would you give this show overall, Martin? Oh, man. I don't, I don't want to go too crazy, but uh, 
how the hell would it like especially for wcw i'd, I'd give this an a i, I had a great yeah, time so would I. I and again i know there's no one more surprised at, at that than me because it's mainly tag team matches there's no world title defense there's like there are only two titles being defended on this whole show one of which is a smosh to kind of get over uh deborah and jeff jarrett being a team so that being said though the storytelling is great everything kind of makes sense the in ring the in the in ring stuff really delivers um yeah it's 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 definitely so many different of, styles like yeah a lot of the problems we'd have great crowd too a great crowd yeah. really well paced like lots of we skits and promos but not overly heavy mm. um the in-ring stuff like you say there it skips along so quickly because yes there's nine matches in this yes a lot of them are tags multi-mans but there's so many different styles like you never get bored like later on we're watching those wcw pay-per-views it's kind of a slog to get through them and when you think back to them it's actually kind of hard to distinguish one match from the other well look uh, i'll put it this way the worst thing on this card would be the best thing on another card as oh, far yeah. as like Raven's promo would have been the highlight of an ECW pay-per-view or would have been the highlight of a TNA show where, you know, it was just the only, the worst thing on this show being that promo was just because it was out of place. It didn't fit, you know, but it would be great somewhere else. And, and that's yeah. a credit. Like, again, look, I, I could have done without Ric Flair um, and, and Roddy Piper, but again, while I wasn't a big fan of Ric Flair's work in this match, Roddy Piper came out looking like an absolute killer. So oh, yeah. Yeah. that's what it should be. You know, any show like this, even if you have someone in there, like as a fan, you should be aiming to build someone, to make someone. And everyone came out looking better for it. And again, look, Glacier, who gave a crowd, who cared about Glacier? But we yeah. really enjoyed that match. Really so, enjoyed it. Um, you know? Look, uh, I think, this is a great pay-per-view for anyone listening to this who isn't aware of much WCW or who thinks of WCW as kind of just a byword for terrible wrestling and mm. a mess booking and just a company falling apart. Yeah. This is a great introduction to like WCW's had over the course of its life some, you know, peaks and some really really good eras and um this is a great introduction into that period 97 early 98 when they were really really hot and there's a reason they were and it's it's this absolutely so nick thank you so much for submitting um your uh, request for us to look at um this show it was a great pick we, we genuinely look we always like to watch whatever you guys send or, you know, sometimes we'll just be like, let's watch this random show. But the fact that you pick something good uh, really helps because one thing we ask maybe <laughs> when you send stuff, either make it really bad or really good because if it's just mid like the, like some of those um, taboo Tuesdays or Cyber Sundays where nothing <laughs> happened, it was like, oh, okay, that's, it's just, it's not a very entertaining show to watch or review or, you know. So we appreciate that you actually picked a really, really good show. And, you know, again, if you guys want to be like Nick, please do um, leave your comments underneath this video. Email us um, or you can reach us on Facebook, which is how Nick reached us. So um, thank you so much for that, sir. We do appreciate it. Um, again, is this your first time checking us out? Please go over to nerdtonomedia.com. All the links are there, the rest are rewind.com, or you can just search it on YouTube, Nerd to Know Media, and you will get all these shows, all the past shows, because look, we basically have four years of shows that haven't gone up yet, and they're going up two, three shows every day. So there's a lot of content just been given for free. But the, oh, the more recent content shows, farm. Absolutely. It's just it's just every every day show's gone out and it's not only this show it's also Nerd to Know Media and a few other shows from uh, other cast members that we have um, working with us so I, if if you like comics if you like video games if you like anime and of course if you like wrestling it's all going to be here and it's all for free we're also on Spotify and the True Penny channel as well Martin is Dunning you want to plug before we get out of here no I'm just raising my fingers in the air and giving a too sweet to Nick Opelowski all the way out in uh Michigan, New Haven. Good man. I back that too. Good man. Too sweet, Nick. Thank you so much, sir. We do appreciate it. Martin, we uh, don't know what we're going to cover next week, but we will we never definitely do. put it up. We never <laughs> well, That's not true. Usually we, we figure it out on a Thursday. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, but uh, worse, worse comes to worse with break glass and uh, <laughs> WWE. <laughs> the WWE. <laughs> we might have to now to get some Jeff Jarrett. We need our Jeff Jarrett fix. <laughs> You're Jones in for double J. That's it. But uh, folks, thank you so much for checking us out. We have been the Wrestling Rewind. We will talk to you next week here on the show. Bye, guys. See you later. Thank you for listening to a Nerd to Know Media production. 